our worship today this last Sunday of February, which focuses on Black History Month. We are not unaware of how issues of power that face us when we deal with Black History Month or misogyny or every child matters resonate beyond our boundaries. Today we acknowledge Black History Month but we also reflect more broadly on how the misuse of power weaves its way through history. And today we particularly think about and pray for the people of the Ukraine. Thank you for joining us as we reflect. Looking ahead, a quick note about next week, March the 6th, which is Lent 1. We will be celebrating communion as is our custom on Lent 1. Individual elements will be provided at the in-person service. However, people are welcome to bring their own elements. And those joining us via YouTube are encouraged to gather elements prior to the worship service. Next week is also the annual meeting and immediately follows the worship service. Lastly, today, we would like to welcome the Reverend Heather McCarroll, who is joining us at Georgian Shores, as in an appointment as our pastoral care minister. We're very excited to have Heather with us and wish her all the best as she connects with us. Thanks again for joining us today. We acknowledge with respect the spirituality, history, and culture of the peoples with whom the Upper Canada Treaties were signed. It's our responsibility as treaty members. We are gathered on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek peoples. May we live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with its people. In challenge and in shadow, the light does not cease to shine. Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Compassion, respect, equality, justice, hope. Lift your voice. It only takes one voice to initiate change. Come, let us lift our voices in worship. Let this be our song, no one stands alone, standing side by side. 
we proceed into the service, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the Reverend Sadaki Little Forbes, who is in ministry at Sharon Hope United Church in Sharon, Ontario, who shared uh, her service for Black History Month, and we based much of our service on it today. Her voice was entitled, It Only Takes One Voice to Initiate Change. So we begin with slavery in Canada. Yes, slavery did exist in Canada. It's estimated that more than 4,000 black men, women, and children were held in slavery in what is now Quebec, Ontario, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and New Brunswick as early as 1628. Upper Canada passed the Limited Act Against Slavery in 1793, and in 1834, slavery was abolished in most of the British Empire, including the Canadian colonies. Every year during Black History Month, we try to learn some new names, identifying trailblazers who have shaped Canada. The first one for today is Chloe Cooley. Chloe was a slave. When her enslaver tied her down in a boat in preparation to selling her, Chloe defended herself, unheard of at that time. She caused such a ruckus that her captor had to get two other men to hold her down. People passing by the scene witnessed it and reported the violence. Chloe's resistance led to a new law that aided in slowly phasing out slavery in Upper Canada. It only takes one voice to initiate change. The Underground Railway. In the early 1800s, Canada and the northern part of the United States gained a reputation for being a haven for the enslaved. Canada had the code name Canaan. Seeking freedom, many enslaved people traveled secretly to Canada and other regions in North America where slavery was abolished through a concealed network known as the Underground Railway. Here in Owen Sound, we understand and acknowledge this as Owen Sound was the northernmost terminal of the Underground Railway. There are many theories about how messages were communicated across the network, from quilts to songs. One common story is of the song, Wade in the Waters, which many people believe was sung as a warning to enslaved people to walk through the water so the slave catcher's dogs could not pick up their scent. Even some modern adaptations of spirituals still give a nod to hidden messages. Walking to Jordan, walking north to the river, sometimes seen as the Ohio, toward freedom.
Good morning. Welcome to the reading for all ages today. This is the last Sunday in the season of Epiphany. It's also the fourth Sunday of February, so the last Sunday in Black History Month. Throughout Black History Month, you'll remember that we've been reading some books in relation to that each week. Today, I wanted to acknowledge the book Trailblazers, the Black Pioneers Who Have Shaped Canada. Um, this book is a wonderful book for families to look at and to see stories of a number of Black Pioneers, many of whose names we do not know. Uh, we've used uh, some of the information from Trailblazers uh, in our service today. So this is a book that I would recommend to all of our families. If any of you would like to borrow it from us here at the church, just give us a call. The actual book we're reading today is called Desmond and the Very Mean Word. It's by Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Douglas Carlton Abrams, and it's illustrated by A.J. Ford. Desmond and the Very Mean Word. Desmond was very proud of his new bicycle. He was the only child in the whole township who had one, and he couldn't wait to show it to Father Trevor. Father Trevor was kind and loving, and when he laughed, his eyes sparkled and his whole body shook. Father Trevor didn't care if you were rich or poor, black or white, old or young. He raised his hat and smiled at everyone he met. He especially loved the children and would even let them play marbles on the floor of his office where he met with many important people who came to visit. As Desmond sped down the dirt road, he admired the bicycle's shiny black body and the white stripe on the ear fender. Oh, wasn't it beautiful. When he turned the corner, he saw a gang of boys and they saw him. They stepped into the road and blocked his path. He didn't dare stop. What if they took his bike? Desmond gripped the handlebar and raced toward the, bo the boy's dust flying behind him. The boys scattered out of the way, but the tallest, a red-haired boy, spat out a very mean word. The other boys laughed and shouted the mean word again and again. Desmond pedaled away as fast as he could. His heart pounded and his chest ached. When Desmond got to Father Trevor's office, he threw down his bicycle. His teeth were clenched and the mean word kept repeating itself over and over inside his head like echoes in a dark cave. Father Trevor looked up as Desmond burst into his office. What's wrong, he asked, excusing himself from a meeting. Father Trevor always knew when something was wrong. Nothing, Desmond said. Father Trevor bent down until he was looking directly in Desmond's face. His smiling eyes always made you feel like you were the most important person in the world. You can tell me anything. Desmond glanced down at his dusty bare feet and finally muttered, some boys. They shouted a very mean word at me. I'm sorry that happened, Father Trevor said. They hurt your feelings, didn't they? Desmond's shoulders relaxed a little, and he nodded. Can you forgive them? Father Trevor asked. No, never, Desmond said, his fist balled at his sides. I will get them back. Father Trevor sighed. That is the problem, Desmond. You will get them back, and then they will get you back, and soon our whole world will be filled with nothing but getting back. That night... Desmond lay in bed trying to read his comic book by candlelight. Instead of the words on the page, he kept seeing the mean word written over and over again. The next day, no matter how fast he pedaled to reach school, Desmond couldn't leave the mean word behind. All day, the mean word followed him around like a shadow in the hot sun. As he rode home that afternoon, he saw the boys again. His hands and face felt hot. 
Maybe, he thought, if he got even, he would stop thinking about what they called him. So he raced past the boys and shouted the meanest word he could think of. He could hear the boys running after him. Desmond pedaled hard, his heart pounding. Finally, he looked back. The boys had given up the chase. At first, Desmond felt proud. But very soon, he began to feel something else. It was not a good feeling. The mean word he had said left a bitter taste in his mouth. After school, the next day, Desmond went to Father Trevor's. Are you feeling better, Desmond? Father Trevor asked as he sat on the floor shooting marbles with the children. Desmond shook his head from side to side and frowned. When people say mean words to us, we often feel ashamed of who we are, Father Trevor said. They can make us feel a little less lovable, but it's not true. Lowering his face close to the floor, Father Trevor lined up a marble in the chalk circle. Desmond, everything we do matters. If we smile or if we frown, if we say something nice or something mean. Father Trevor flicked the shooter with his thumb and hit the marble out of the circle. When we hurt someone, Father Trevor said as he got up, it hurts us too. That night, Father Trevor dropped in to see Desmond's parents. Desmond carried a pot of tea into the living room and then went outside. Usually he would try to listen to what the adults were saying, but tonight he just wanted to be alone. Sitting on the doorstep, Desmond looked up at the starry sky, an empty ache in his chest. He thought he could even see the mean word written on the face of the moon. That's a very nice bicycle you have, Father Trevor said as he sat down next to Desmond. The black paint gleamed in the moonlight. Desmond had forgotten to show his bike to Father Trevor. It didn't matter now. He just shrugged and turned his back. He didn't want to talk, not even to Father Trevor. Still thinking about that mean word, Father Trevor asked. Desmond slowly nodded. Our hearts are fragile and easily hurt. This is why we were given a way to heal them. It's called forgiveness. How can I forgive them? They haven't said their story. You don't need to wait until someone says their story to forgive them. You have the power to forgive whenever you are ready. I'm not ready, Desmond said. That's fine, Desmond. Only you will know when you are. Father Trevor got up to leave. Desmond felt a lump in his throat. Father Trevor said very softly, let me tell you a secret, Desmond. When you forgive someone, you free yourself from whatever they have said or done. It's like magic. A week later, Desmond was riding his bicycle down the street when he saw the boy with the red hair surrounded by two older boys. That'll teach you, one of them said, dunking the head of the red-haired boy into a bucket of water. Seconds later, the boy managed to raise his head, his wet hair standing up like a carrot top. He looked like he was about to cry. A woman appeared at the door. Leave your brother alone. You are as bad as your father. Now get in this house before I... She didn't finish her sentence before the brothers were inside and the door had slammed shut. To Desmond's surprise, he felt sorry for the red-haired boy. A few days later, Desmond ran into the neighborhood market to buy his father a newspaper. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw a flash of red. Turning, Desmond realized it was the red-haired boy. He was standing alone in front of the candy counter. It was filled with lollipops and delicious chocolates. Desmond wanted to say something, but what? Think of the mean word he had shouted at the boy. Desmond finally blurted out, I'm sorry for what I said. The boy looked at him speechless. Finally, he stammered, I guess I'm, well, Desmond didn't need to the boy to say he was sorry. It would have been nice, but as Father Trevor had said, it really wasn't necessary. I forgive you, Desmond said quietly. As soon as the words were out of his mouth, Desmond felt a little stronger and a little braver and stood up a little taller. After buying the newspaper, Desmond went outside. The red-haired boy was sitting on a milk crate under a shady tree. The boy stood up and moved toward him. Desmond froze. 
The boy looked around to see if anyone was watching and then handed Desmond a piece of candy. For just a moment, Desmond looked into the other boy's eyes and smiled. Then he hurried to get back on his bike, first popping the piece of chocolate in his mouth. As the sun set behind the houses, Desmond pedaled home fast, not out of fear, but out of joy. The cool wind felt good against his face. He wanted the sweet taste of chocolate on his tongue to last forever. Slowly, he spread his arms out wide as if he were flying. At last, Desmond knew what it felt like to be free. It was as if he could embrace the whole world in his outstretched arms. Our Hebrew scripture reading today is taken from Habakkuk. This is a paraphrase of the first chapter, verses 1 to 4, and the second chapter, verses 1 to 4. The problem as God gave the church to see it. God, how long will we have to cry? How long? How long do we have to sing, pray, and act before we experience your promised commonwealth of love, peace, and justice. When will these days of longing be over? How long will we cry without laughter? For how long will our hypocrisy go unchallenged? We seek to be the community that you call us to be, but our best intentions still lead to acts of exclusion. We seek to be open, caring, and whole but our best intentions still lead to brokenness and judgment. We seek to be hospitable, but our welcome is blocked by our prejudices. Our dreams remain thwarted by our actions. We fearfully and hungrily await your vision. You respond with a taste of the kingdom to come. And now that we have tasted your vision, it consumes us. We constantly hunger for it, and we cannot be satisfied. Why did you give us this unrelenting hunger? It haunts us. You respond with a commandment. Write the vision, live the vision, be the vision, own the vision, even while we wait for it to come. Be patient and forgiving with ourselves and with one another. For even when we falter, God's vision will not die. Be clear and plain about the vision so that the people around us, our friends and neighbors, can read it plainly in our words and actions. Be encouraged, you say, for a change is going to come. The reading is from Luke 9, verses 28 to 36. About eight days later, Jesus took Peter, John, and James with him and went up on the mountain to pray. While he was praying, his face changed and his clothes became shining white. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah were there speaking with him. They appeared in heavenly glory and talked all about the, what Jesus' death in Jerusalem would mean. Peter and the other two disciples had been sound asleep. All at once they woke up and saw how glorious Jesus was. They also saw the two men who were with him. Moses and Elijah were about to leave when Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But Peter did not know what he was talking about. While Peter was still speaking, a shadow from a cloud passed over them, and they were frightened as the, the cloud covered them. From the cloud, a voice spoke, This is my chosen son. Listen to what he says. After the voice had spoken, Peter, John, and James saw only Jesus. For some time, they kept quiet and did not say anything about what they had seen. Segregation. Segregated schools, as well as other forms of segregated legislation, existed in Canada. 
The majority of segregated schools were located in Essex and Kent counties in Ontario, where black communities had been established during the Underground Railway era. Many voices in Canada worked toward initiating change, such as Leonard Braithwaite, Canada's first black provincial legislator, or Father Dean T. Wagner, who initiated a hospital and school for black children who were not welcomed in the community. One such story, a name for today, is Bernice Redman, who applied to nursing school in Canada but was rejected because of her skin color. However, U.S. nursing schools accepted black students, so Bernice crossed the border and got her degree. She then returned to Canada and worked in Nova Scotia as the country's first black nurse. Bernice's voice helped change racist admission policy and made health care more diverse. It only takes one voice to initiate change. Race riot. Race riots existed in Canada. In fact, the first recorded race riot in North America was on July 26, 1784 in Shelburne, Nova Scotia. It lasted for about 10 days. The riot began when a group of white loyalists stormed the home of David George, a black Baptist preacher in Shelburne, who was baptizing other white loyalists. The rioting mob tore down the church and the houses of 20 other free black loyalists living on the church's property, and they physically attacked George. He was badly beaten and subsequently chased out of town. Yet David George persisted in his ministry by preaching in the woods and planting numerous churches in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. It only takes one voice to initiate change. Civil rights activists. The story of Viola Desmond, a black businesswoman who refused to sit in the blacks only section of a movie theater, predates the story of Rosa Parks, a black civil rights activist who refused to sit in the blacks only section of the bus. Over the last few years, we have come to know her story well, but there are others. Stanley G. Grizzle, a porter, a civil rights and labor union activist and the first black judge of citizenship. Bromley Armstrong, a human rights activist, community organizer, and advocate for the working poor. His activism led to stronger laws against discrimination in Canada and the world's first agency dedicated to promoting enforce and enforcing human rights, the Ontario Human Rights Commission. It only takes one voice to initiate change. That voice, and then another added to it, it creates a ripple effect and keeps the change going.
before us, we will continue to work for equal rights and justice for all. When we see injustice, it is the prompting of the spirit for us to do something about it. We offer all our gifts to you at the prompting of the spirit, and we honor these gifts in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, accept these gifts. Bless them and use them to bring peace to places of unrest, love to places of hate, joy to places of fear, hope to places of loss, and equal rights and justice for all. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Today as we prepare to pray, we continue with one of our customs, lighting a candle for people and situations that we wish to hold in our hearts. I invite you to light a candle at home for any situation or person whose name you would like to lift up. Today, I hold in my heart, as we have over the past few weeks, but most especially today, the people of the Ukraine. I'm going to use this color from their flag to remind us of our call to be a people of prayer, who love and support them and who pray for peace. May it move us to whatever actions we can take on behalf of all those who suffer there today. I lift up also again the families of the Kasikus First Nation who discovered 54 unmarked graves. And we remember all the children who never returned home and families who lost loved ones to COVID. Globally, 5.93 million. In Ontario, 12,347. And in Canada, 36,332. And all those that you lift up in silence today. Please join me in prayer. It is good to sing praises of your goodness, God, even when we look with shame to a past filled with those who initiated, participated, sustained and perpetuated the forceful removal of over 10 million Africans from their homes for trade across the Atlantic. We come with many, many names. Terms of endearment that we cherish and labels that we seek one day to destroy. Do you call us by one name, beloved? We remember your healing acts. 
We remember how you gathered the dislocated and dispersed black peoples in Nova Scotia and Ontario to build communities and relearn cultures that were torn away. We remember the Maroons who with their hands built a mighty fortress on a hill. We remember Viola Desmond, Carrie Best, John Freeman Walls, Harriet Tubman, Chloe Cooley, Frederick Douglass, Rosa Parks, Leonard Braithwaite, Michaela Jean, Samuel Sharp, Marcus Mosiah Garvey, Nanny of the Maroons, and other heroes whose actions have brought freedom and equality closer to black people in our society. We remember how your everlasting love healed the self-esteem and rebuilt the self-worth of black peoples who were stripped of their human rights and dignity. We remember that you continue to heal the brokenhearted and bind up the wounds of those who have been wounded, abused, and denied because of the shade of their skin, even today. Like Moses, give us the courage to confront the systems that hold people captive and prevent them from achieving their full potential. Like Elijah, help us to be zealous in our calls for the deliverance of your people. Like Jesus, Give us the grace to follow through on our plans to be an anti-racist denomination and make the sacrifices necessary to make this a reality. We offer to you all the things that we can no longer carry on our own, our burdens, our worries, our concerns. We offer to you all the situations that we feel ill-equipped for. When we see injustice and unjust acts in our community, let the light of Christ that change us, through us, change the world. And remind, remind us, us that, that it takes one voice to initiate change. change. Amen. And in the name of the God of love, we lift our voices saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, as, as we forgive, forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. journey is hard. Although the mountains are too high and the valleys are too low, by your grace give us hope. 
By your power, give us strength. By your mercy, give us wisdom so that we may continue to go where you lead us until, until all your children are safe from harm. May we go with your light shining in us as we carry justice and equality into the world, bring about change with our voice. Amen.